can see attendees joining. We'll probably wait a minute or two to let everybody come on. Okay, folks, welcome everybody to this fireside chat on how kids are changing the way we think about voice. Uh, we're delighted to be here with you today. Thank you all for making time in the middle of December for this webinar. My name is Neil Bushnell. I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at Soapbox Labs and I will be the moderator of today's session. Um, before we kick off and I introduce you to our expert panelists, just a couple of housekeeping rules. So we will keep this to 60 minutes. We will do our best not to go over uh, on time for you all today. Uh, we will be recording the sessions. So before the end of the week, you will receive a recording of uh, this session with a survey asking you how we did and if you have ideas for, uh, for, future, uh, for future webinars, uh, future activities from Soapbox. Uh, we invite your questions. We would love to hear from you and get your questions. The best way to do that will be to use the Q&A function here on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. We won't be using the chat today. So add your questions to the Q&A and, uh, and I will serve them up as we go along. We'll probably do um, a, a break, uh, pause for some questions, maybe halfway through the hour, and then towards the end, maybe 10, 15 minutes before we break, uh, we will go back to, to get more questions from you. If you feel like adding some context to your question, uh, the company you work with, the industry you're in, uh, anything else that can help us to address you more specifically, uh, please feel free to do that. So as many of you know, Soapbox Labs is the speech technology company for kids. We have built proprietary speech technology from the ground up for kids' voices ages two to 12 years old. And we will be talking a lot more about kids and why we build speech technology for them uh, from, from Soapbox Labs. We've been around since 2013. We have customers and kids using our technology across five continents. The use cases abound. We've had some great new use cases this year, but primarily uh, use cases for our voice tech is in literacy, all the way from pre-literate through to fluency and comprehension. Uh, language learning is a huge one. Um, math is another one that's emerging as a big area of voice enabled experiences for kids doing their fast timetables, for example. Um, in the play space, we work with companies who are building voice enabled experiences with AR, um, with toys, with mobile games, with interactive TV. So, so loads going on across all of those different areas and the panelists will be touching on those in much more detail today. Uh, we are a complete voice platform for kids. So not only do we license our technology to third party entertainment and education companies, we also strategically partner with companies that are new to voice technology and that need our help on that step-by-step -step journey from everything from you know, design and UX through to building, implementing, scaling, and bringing a successful voice experience to kids that they can delight in, that's magical for them, that empowers them, that makes them feel heard in the digital world. So that's all about Soapbox. Um, I am so delighted to have our two panelists here today. Dr. Amelia Kelly is our VP of Speech Technology. Uh, Amelia has been with Soapbox Labs since the very early days and is one of the primary people responsible for building our great award-winning technology. So welcome, Amelia. Um, I also am delighted to introduce James Poulter, who is the co-founder and CEO of Vixen Labs based in London and in Berlin. And Vixen are Europe's leading uh, agency in voice consulting, and they do a lot of strategy work with Fortune 500 companies around conversation and voice experiences. So we have a lot in common, let's just say, between us and Vixen Labs, and looking forward to getting into that in more detail. So. 
without further ado, let's dive in and uh, set the stage, Amelia. Why voice tech specifically for kids? What's so unique about kids that we need to build voice technology for them? You know, this is one of the questions that I get asked the most. Um, people know about speech technology, they've used speech technology, um, they've used speech recognition, and then they're saying, you know, wh why for kids? Why do kids need it? Um, well, there are, as you said, there are so many use cases that we see in the educational and um, play spaces. But when it comes down to the technology, uh, as you mentioned, I've had the pleasure of working with Soapbox Labs since the very early days. And that meant uh, I started in a greenfield site of building speech technology for, for children. How do we begin this and how do we do it? The challenges, I have to say, working with this data were unique and very, very hard as a problem from a technology point of view. And one of the reasons is really just the acoustic waveform, if you want to get scientific about it. When children speak, they sound a lot different from adults. So if you focus just on the uh, pitch, of the voice themselves. Children are shorter and smaller and they've got smaller vocal tracts, they've got smaller vocal folds. And what this amounts to is a higher pitched audio file that has um, energy in different parts of the spectrum from adult voices. So when you're building an acoustic model or a speech recognition system, you need to be able to build for these unique audio waveforms, but it really goes beyond that. Um, so when children speak, they use speech patterns very, very different from the ones that adults use. And they use different speech patterns at different stages of their development. So, uh, for example, you know, I have, I have a, a three-year-old and um, when I started in Soapbox, I didn't have any children. So um, over the last three years, I've, I've seen um, my daughter um, grow and her speech patterns develop. And obviously, I'm listening to them with, with great professional interest. Um, so, for example, when she was quite young, she couldn't pronounce the word green. She'd say B instead. And then as she got older, that progressed to uh, bean and then that progressed on again to green she says it perfectly now as a three and a half year old um, but it's it's a good example of um, how words are um, articulated differently by children from adults and this is why speech recognition adult speech recognition does not work for kids um, so we do a lot of testing in house we do baseline testing and all of this and it's just it's almost like um a huge big problem that nobody had sat down and tried to solve before Soapbox Labs came along. So um, not only do we model for these different speech patterns, and it's, I mean, it's not only the articulation, it's the turns of phrase, um, it's saying things backwards, um, using strange language, but um, it's not only that, but it's um, everything about speech tech. We've had to redesign and reimagine every single step in the development of the speech platform when it comes to kids' speech. And the reason at the end of the day is just that kids aren't just a subset of adults. It's, it's not really enough to um, take adult speech recognition and then just say, ah, sure, it's good enough. It may not work fine for kids, but sure, they'll grow into it, won't they? But I mean, what you're missing out on with that attitude is all the benefits you can get from voice recognition uh, when you build it specifically for kids, focusing on kids. and um, that allows you to offer uh, voice enabled experiences for children that are they're easy, they're joyful, they're frictionless. And if you can get them to work for kids and we really focus on accuracy here and privacy, which again, they're they're you really need to level up when you're dealing with kids voice data here. Um, these are all the reasons why we have um, focused on speech tech for kids and why we've had to build everything differently from the ground up with kids in mind. Did you know when you said out, Amelia, you mentioned that you were you weren't a mother when you first joined Soapbox. Did you have any idea back then how complex this would be? I, I really didn't because I didn't know that many children, but I am a scientist and I have worked with a lot of voice data over the course of my career. And, you know, all it took was a couple of listens to, to some of um, the, the child voices and that. And then it's like, well, OK, we've got a problem here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and obviously working with a lot of kids down, like working and listening to my daughter, I just hear more and more examples and talking to our clients as well. They always have their own examples of, of how kids say things differently. And uh, yeah, it, it's it's very interesting. 
Yeah, it's fine. Our clients always have their own favorite ways, as you say, of their own kids and how they how they talk backwards or differently. Um, James, you talk a lot. You did a great presentation last week at uh, Voice Summit in DC, and I picked it up and listened to it with a lot of enjoyment and interest. And one of the things you talked about from the very top of your talk was about how voice is moving from being a kind of a convenience play and a nice to have for adults into something that will help adults with their productivity that's becoming a necessity for adults. And my immediate thought was, if voice is becoming a necessity for adults, it's becoming even more of a necessity probably for kids. Can you tell us more about your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity to kind of work with you guys on, on this session and, and nice to meet everybody. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, last week, we, um, you know, Niv mentioned this uh, presentation we gave at Voice Summit um, in DC, which is kind of one of the biggest uh, events in our, our industry. And um, in that, we really kind of talking about where voice might go in 2022 and across these areas of you know, media and control it's a huge area commerce so around kind of how we spend and save our money and uh, we'll talk later about the kind of I suppose the ideas around the metaverse which I'm sure everyone is thinking about in um, one way or another no matter how bullish or bearish you are on on the future of it uh, but all three of those things they really impact um, adults and they really impact kids um, you know in terms of the way in which uh, both their experience of using products and services today and where that's going to go in the future um, and so I suppose if you think first of all on kind of media this is the thing that we think of probably the most when it comes to kids right now uh, I, I myself have also uh, got two uh, young uh, ladies that live in my house that are mine <laughs> they're the six and three year olds um, who are um, you know kind of experts I suppose in using voice technology more than probably most and uh, the biggest thing that they probably do with it day to day is control media in different forms now whether they think about it that way or not um, I don't think so but th that is what they're doing um, they're you know searching on Netflix they are asking things uh, to Alexa and to Google they're playing with interactive toys that are using voice technology under the hood to get some of this stuff done. And it's become part of their world um, in such a heavy way in the past couple of years, um, particularly during the pandemic, as you know, particularly things like online and homeschooling has been a factor as well, that it's setting an expectation that um, is going to run and run, in my opinion. Yeah, as we kind of look to the future, those kids are going to enter into classrooms and eventually enter into workplaces, but also retail environments and every other situation you can think of with an expectation that they'll be able to talk to their technology, that it will understand them and that they will get a, um, a relevant an accurate and hopefully quite an empathetic answer back um, and that's not always the experience that we have today with all of these things and uh, and thankfully for the work that you guys are doing and similarly the types of uh, projects we're working on with clients we're trying to bring that to bear for most people but it's absolutely becoming a necessity to get this right because it's going to become an expectation and as i say as we talk later about the ideas of things like the metaverse yeah you know, even more so there when we begin to think about the future of potentially augmented and, and virtual reality experiences where voice is the control paradigm um and will also be a kind of main means of authentication and identity in the future so very excited about where we see uh, this space going Great, great. And that's a great jumping off point, I think, into the other side of the coin from necessity is privacy. So I'd love to talk to you both a little bit about privacy. Uh, maybe, Amelia, you kick us off on that. I mean, so Box is a privacy first company. We talk a lot about privacy by design. And I think it's one of the reasons that we talk about very highly about why you have to build voice tech that's specific from the ground up for kids, right? Because the privacy needs of kids are so different and so much greater than for adults. Would you talk us a little bit through that? And then I'd love to, James, you can, for you to riff on it and, and, and take it, take it somewhere else for us. Um, yeah, I think that is um, uh, spot on what you're saying there about um, having to consider privacy at the forefront of anything you do when you're working with children's data. Um, Children, they can't, uh, they, they don't have any um, ability to say, use my data or don't use my data. It's up to their parents to decide. And it's very, very important that we make it very clear what it means uh, to have data, to use data for kids. Um, all our clients, um, education and games and media and toys, everybody brings up privacy. Everybody is increasingly concerned about it. And it wasn't always the case because people didn't really understand the extent of how important it is. 
Um, but it's a huge area of concern now when it comes to our clients. And it's something that we can happily address um, up front in a very transparent way, because from the very, very beginning, we have built this technology with privacy in mind. So um, we've been working um, for, for many, many, many years on this from the very beginning. Um, we think that privacy by design, which is what we're, we, we go by in the badge we put on the processes we have, it doesn't just mean that we're generally careful about um, kids' voice data. It means that at every step in the technology building journey, we have proactively been taking steps to ensure that um, the building um, processes um, are intact from a privacy point of view, that we can never identify an individual uh, child, for example. Um, our data is um, anonymized, it's depersonalized, it never ever gets used for marketing, it never gets um, licensed to third parties, for example. Um, our data, the reason we need it, and the only reason we need it, is to improve our voice models so we can improve the experiences that children have when they use voice interaction technology. Um, so as a company, we always make sure we're fully compliant with legislation, including G GDPR and COPPA. And um, actually, we've some great articles out there. Um, for example, our CEO, Martin Farrows, um, had a great article in VoiceBot recently where um, he shares five calls to action for the rest of the industry um, about how you can be upfront and transparent with your privacy um, strategy for your business. And I really recommend that everybody checks that out. Great, Amelia. James, I mean, one of the things I guess that we, you know, we talk about a lot is how as an independent voice company, we have no kind of competing business model. So, you know, the data that we get through people using our voice technology, it's used to improve our models, as Amelia says. It's not used to, for, to build a profile of a child, to advertise to them or to advertise to their parents or to you know, track them over a lifetime, et cetera, or to, to understand what they're interested in, in in different ways from a marketing and advertising perspective. We think that's massive. And I'm curious to know, I mean, I'm sure privacy comes into play in your conversations with clients. How do you see that with the companies that you're working with, privacy becoming a bigger deal are you know the conversation that you're having with them this year and into 2022 what role does privacy play in those chats absolutely yeah so i mean privacy is definitely a, a huge uh, paradigm that we have to kind of wrestle with whether that's on third party services like um, amazon and google uh, apple and, and samsung or whether it's in the first party uh, and they present different sets of challenges in the third party as you highlighted there are obviously concerns around what's going on with data particularly when capturing it it's worth saying that when we're building um, experiences for children in those spaces that, that similar things are in place, right? Compliance with copper and GDPR, both in terms of the design and also the, the practices. Um, but there is a kind of broader consideration set that you have to think about how, um, you know, kind of the how much can we really guarantee that kids and adults are using these things separately? Things that are often advertised as family experiences may often also be doing some stuff to try and target children. Certainly not from anything we're building, but it, it's a concern. But equally, there's concern on the on the first party perspective. You're building a custom assistant, or you're doing something like integrating voice technology into, um, you know, your platforms. You know, obviously, working with you guys, um, you know, that's that you've got those kind of assurances in terms of the way in which things are designed. But it goes beyond just the voice technology. It goes into all of the other things that sit behind that, um, whether that's moderation whether that's you know kind of um the visual aspects of things and so not just voice technology but also thinking about when voice is often paired in augmented or virtual reality with imagery or video or other things where we need to think about that and then it's also then about the ethics and moral uh, choices that go into things like recommendation algorithms and other pieces of content that sit around the voice experience you know voice often is the i, I would say the control paradigm or you know some kind of the social paradigm in these experiences but it's not always the the entirety right some of these things are voice first but they're not voice only and we have to um, make sure that those things are, are married up um yeah earlier this year we conducted a, a big piece of research called the voice consumer index uh, which is uh, kind of a flagship study that we do here at vixen looking at consumer behavior around voice in the uk the us and um germany and whilst that doesn't look specifically at kids we did spend a lot of time looking at what parents and adults do in these situations and yeah we know that privacy is one of the biggest concerns for people using voice technology but there are nuances to it privacy and safety safety are not necessarily the same things. People might think that something is safe, but they're still concerned about what data they might be giving up. And at the same time, people are um, worried about the privacy of these things, but in different settings. So we see that there's this kind of public private privacy that people um, have 
um, interesting. You're, you're more willing, for example, to use your voice out loud in your home, surrounded by other people to control and manage something and maybe say some stuff that's maybe personal data in that context than you ever are to use it on your headphones or in the car or perhaps in some kind of retail um, or leisure destination. So it's not necessarily one rule uh, for all situations. And one thing we also know is that whilst often when you ask consumers, um, you know, are you worried about your privacy? Anyone that's you know kind of thinking about it, even just a little bit, is going to say, yes, of course, I'm worried about my privacy. That doesn't necessarily translate into shaping or changing behavior, particularly. People will still use things, even though they might have that concern. I mean, you know, Facebook has enough users out there in the world to know that that's true. And people will still use these things and say that they're concerned about them. But what it really means for us, and this is one of the reasons why we, along with you guys and others, are part of things like the Open Voice Network, which I think is a fantastic organization to really stand for these you know, values of authenticity, openness, and trust um, is that we build voice experiences in particular with that privacy um, by design mindset so that we're never asking for more data than is required to do a good job and particularly when it comes into um, you know kids and parents often kids might be using the experience but parents are the ones that are discovering and managing the use of that experience and so it's really important that we're also honoring the the data that parents might want to give over in that situation to make that experience better whilst being safeguarded and protective over the data that children might accidentally give up even if they weren't aware that that was something they were going to do so it's definitely something we need to manage and i think as we go into um you know the next couple of years following on from things like the facebook whistleblowers that we've seen in recent years obviously concerns as um you know the company expands its um you know remit as meta tries to kind of take over a larger and larger portion of the internet um and obviously are the proprietors of one of the primary metaverse experiences in the form of things like oculus um yeah we have to we have to think about that um, very keenly so that when these voice activated experiences come to bear and um, that they are they are built with that privacy by design yeah absolutely um uh, Amelia, just to, to touch on something you mentioned, a VoiceBot article that Martin, our CEO, wrote. Um, if people are interested, by the way, in reading more about voice and privacy, uh, we also did a submission to the UN uh, with uh, a, a, a professional academic who does a lot of work in this area, Dr. Veronica Berezi. She does a lot of work on privacy and kids. And she talks about, you know, voice, um, people think of voice as ephemeral, that once you've spoken that that goes away, but actually it's like a fingerprint, it's, a, you know, a voice print is something that stays and that is very identifiable to your voice. Your voice is unique to you and it's something that can be used to build a profile of you across your life. I think a lot of people, when you don't think about it, it doesn't occur to you and when you hear it, then you're kind of like, okay, it's it's obvious, but it is something that um, that we're pretty proud of. So there's a that, that, that submission to the UN is on our website. Actually, you can download it if you're interested in, in reading our, about our joint submission about uh, protecting kids' voice voice data and how important it is. Um, so so to, to turn, turn the tone a little bit to uh, celebrating, let's celebrate uh, some of the great use cases in voice for a second here. Um, who wants to start by uh, suggesting some of their favorite uh, voice uh, experiences that they've seen or being involved in building over the last uh, 12, 24 months. Amelia, do you want to do you want to kick us off there? I have so many of them, so many. But uh, one that just springs to mind there, um, James, you were saying that uh, your kids are interacting, um, they're controlling media in one form or another, I think is what you said. Currently in my house, that, that form is me. I'm the one who changes the channel on demand and changes the program on demand. So um, my daughter, um, it was watching some uh, movie where there was a koala strutting down the streets of Sydney recently with a song on it and she thinks they're, it's absolutely hilarious. So her demand for me today is she wants to watch Paw Patrol and then she wants to watch The Funny Lads. So I know what that means. So I know how to change the channel, but it really reminds me of um, a, a use case uh, that, that one of our clients is working on at the moment where it's interactive um, TV so that the Kid doesn't have to go and tell mom she wants to watch the funny lads, but she can say it to the TV herself. So um, that I think that's just so powerful. Like considering that kids, they they don't have the control over the media in any other ways. In in, in some way, they're disempowered in that way. They can't really use the remote control as dexterously as an adult. They uh, can't use a keyboard. 
um, but if they can use their voice to change channel to um, and if the technology is smart enough to know what they mean as well, I think that's really, really interesting. Um, working in technology for a, a long time, um, it's tempting to say that was a hard problem to solve. So here I've solved it. Everyone, you know, should celebrate this now. But usually what happens is people go, yeah, but, you know, what's it going to do for me? How is that going to work for me? Having voice technology work for kids is definitely super important, but it's step one to anything else that you can achieve. And that's why like at Soapbox, for example, we um, build a technology that then is used by um, third parties to put in their own um, products and platforms, and they make these experience experiences for kids, such as um, how do you interact with the TV if you have the character talking out of the television to the kid going, where do you want to go? Do you want to uh, do this magic trick or do you want to go into the deep, dark forest? And the kid can then say, well, I want to go to the deep, dark forest. And um, then the, the character on the TV knows what they mean and can trigger that action. Uh, because they can rely on this accurate uh, voice technology for kids that's uh, in the interim that's powering it. Um, but use cases on top of that, I mean, that there's so many like that. That's really empowering one for kids to control different types of media. Um, also, you know, that, that could be on the TV, but it can also be in a smart speaker. And again, when it comes to understanding kids, it's not just the, um, the voices themselves, but also the speech patterns and the idiosyncrasies that are kind of more common to kids than adults. And again, not to be harping on about my daughter, I'm sure I do this all the time, but she is currently obsessed with Dusty Springfield and says to me every day, uh, mom, can you play Dusty Springfield? But a couple of weeks ago, she was kind of, mom, can you play uh, Sprinky? <laughs> and I kind of knew what she meant. So, uh, I mean, if you can have um, voice technology that can understand that and can trigger an action based on this interaction, then that, that that's absolutely amazing. Um, on top of that, you know, sorry, James. Well, no, I was just going to jump on. I think what's, so this, this kind of music discovery and content discovery thing, I think, is one of the most interesting areas um, because this is where, you know, it's a mixture, right, of, um, of the design and data, these two things kind of playing together nicely. So, you know, I think a lot of people think it's like only in the design and actually this is a big question about how do we structure metadata for those of you that are maybe on um you know kind of on this call or watching afterwards you know you're, you're going out uh, over christmas period over the next few weeks and trying to find christmas music or holiday music if you're in the us or things like that maybe or, or christmas music for kids right these types of requests you know as parents we're often finding things that we want you know the kids to listen to because you're just fed up of hearing the same three songs over and over and over again your, your spotify uh, rewind has been completely ruined with sleep sounds and disney princesses and um you yeah, know we're trying to find new things and i think yeah, you know, design is an absolutely kind of core part of that where you need to design experiences that help people navigate that and then the coupling of that is designing really great data sets that kind of go underneath it. I think one of the things that we've do, been doing this uh, year working with um, people like Sony Music and, and some of the labels that sit within that is to really look at how do we optimize the content that sits on some of these big content houses like um, like Spotify, like Amazon Music, like Prime, all of which are obviously you know kind of open to, to all. <laughs> and one of the most primary use cases of voice um, that any of us can think of is discovering music or TV shows. Um, I think yeah, it's really exciting because you know, we're beginning to see things come through now, like secondary genres, like versions, um, some of these kind of new um, metadata fields that are being basically added at the catalog level to some of this content. Um, and working with some of our um, you know, kind of experiences within labels like Magic Star, which is Sony's uh, kids label, trying to look at, okay, well, how might we actually help people find you know, Christmas music for kids, right? You know, there'll be a playlist called Christmas music for kids, but you know, there might be an individual track out there that has none of those words in it, but we can now actually help kids um, and families discover new content through the metadata side of things and also um, through kind of designing great, you know, kind of discovery experiences um, like that, you know, which I think has not been something that the, the industry has kind of spent much time uh, thinking about. And to everything that media is saying, you know, that's partly on the data side and then coming full circle back to the design it's also thinking about well how will kids ask for this stuff you know kids 
um, you know, we know tend to really, um, you know, relate to, to characters, to shows, to themes. They, they don't really care too much about what channel it's on. They don't really care about what time it's on, even what service they saw it on, you know, what difference it makes to them that it was on Netflix or Disney Plus. So it's really important that we design, you know, the way in which people can kind of get to these um, pieces of content at a data level and from an experience standpoint. Because and, and that's where I think one of the biggest use cases for voices we kind of go forward is going to be is you know, designing great content discovery. So if you're deploying, you know, um, your own assistant to navigate a content library that you own, or maybe that might be in the education space, if you've got hundreds of courses or episodes of different pieces of content that kids need to kind of get into or in the entertainment space, um, you know, that child directed search um, is, is actually a really interesting um, space to, to explore. Totally, totally. Um, I, I've heard the word data a couple of times and it tempts me to go to dive into the data thing, but let's hold back for a second because actually, Amelia, one of the questions that's come in on the Q&A is around using voice technology for language learning, uh, language learning, for example. So maybe you'd, I mean, it's one of our, it's one of our favorite use cases, I think, of, of many, but maybe you would just answer that question. Um, I think it's Jessica. Jessica Goldberg asked about the soapbox. Uh, oh, sorry, no, that's sorry. She has a separate question. This is uh, where is it? Malone and Levy asked about yeah using using voice tech for language learning for ESL etc. Um, and have you seen companies do that? And we certainly have. Maybe just give us a, a bit of a background on that if you don't mind. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, I was actually going to mention it as well because you know having having focused on some of these uh, user interactions. Um, the other huge big use case for um, child speech recognition and child voice technology is um, in the educational space. So if we think about language learning, it's absolutely massive. We have one client, uh, Lingumi, and their story is really quite inspiring because um, them, like they, like a lot of other educational companies, they really want to deliver this experience for kids for language learning that's engaging and immersive and crucially encourages the child to speak out loud in an expressive manner in order to practice a language because that's how you learn a language. Uh, it's the best way to learn a language. So they set up their platform to do just that and they had one missing piece and that piece was that the child would speak and they weren't able to give the child any personalized feedback on exactly how they'd done. Um, so uh, Lingumi got in touch with us one day and uh, we um, hooked them up to the system and they had it incorporated and integrated into their system within 48 hours i think and had it live <laughs> in fact we were so we, we didn't notice we're like oh we got a big spike what's going on here um but it's been hugely successful for them and the feedback um that they've been getting and i mean you can go on youtube and look at it them uh, uh, yourself they even hold competitions where um, parents send in videos of their kids using their their platform and you can see the response that the kids have when they get this personalized feedback, when the um, technology hears what they've said and can uh, the developer then can issue the score back to the child of how well they said something. And then the child to get that information and get the celebration and the, um, the animated graphic or, or whatever kind of reward it is, it's absolutely massive. And it, it's really encourages kids, makes it just a fun and joyful experience um, for the kids who are, are learning another language. And yeah. um, I think the same goes for literacy. Um, we have, for example, Amplifier, a huge uh, client of ours. They're a massive educational publisher in the US. And um, they're using uh, the Soapbox engine to um, surface data points to teachers about how well individual students are reading uh, passages. So it's not just individual words or phonemes. It's um, big passages, multi-phrase passages of text where a child might be reading for a minute or so. And, um, you know, when we're, we're building voice technology for kids, we find that um, these use cases are so important because it's not enough just to return the transcription of an audio file in this case. What the teachers want, what the educators want, and what the children ultimately need is further information and further analysis of the audio file where you can compare it to the text that the child was supposed to read in that scenario. And you can say, well, they read this word correctly, but actually in this case, they substituted one word for another. And Soapbox technology allows you not only to do that, but to look at the word that was said wrong and see what was said instead and get a phoneme by phoneme uh, confidence scores of every word that were spoken. This goes far beyond any analysis that a teacher uh, could or would do when they were doing their own uh, fluency uh, markup by hand. So it's a huge tool for teachers. It's a huge time saver. 
um, it's uh, another uh, weapon in the teacher's arsenal for uh, figuring out, for example, which kids might be falling behind in the reading, which kids aren't practicing enough, or even seeing any systematic pronunciation errors that a child might have or articulation errors, because that data is surfaced back to the teacher and the user, not necessarily the child, unless it's appropriate. But the teacher then can then tr track longitudinally to um, over the, all the children's practice over years or more to see um, how they've developed and whether intervention is necessary and appropriate at different stages in the child's literacy journey. Um, you, you mentioned some of the cute videos on our on our YouTube channel. If you if you if you want to see how this um, technology works with language learning and literacy, as Amelia said, there's some unbelievably cute kids <laughs> using our technology. I have to say, I the, the 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 example for the teacher is so powerful, and the data that it gives back to teachers and helps them to do that personalized instruction and intervention. But what's what I love watching is the kids getting that immediate feedback themselves if they're doing math or if they're reading and they get a high score. I mean, the thrill and the agency and the confidence that they get is just, you know, it's something unique that voice can give them that they don't have to have an adult sitting beside them. I, I, that's the thing I get the, uh, the, the, the biggest thrill from myself. Um, we're gonna, let's keep going. Uh, we, we have a bunch of questions coming in. I think we'll leave the questions towards the end. And for anybody who's asking questions, if you can move all of your questions to the Q&A out of the chat, you may not have heard me mention that at the start so that we have everything in the, in the Q&A that will give us a better chance of, uh, of answering them for you. Um, James. Let's talk brands for a moment and uh, and look into our crystal balls a little bit. Do you, what's your sense of brands needing to take control, more control of the voice experience and take it out of those kind of third party, big tech generally ecosystems? Uh, are brands going to be in 2022, see more brands doing voice first experiences and why, why and what does that mean for them? What's the value of that for them? Yeah, I think we see a kind of a mixed bag on this one. Um, I think what you know, one of the kind of the things the big tech kind of players are obviously bringing is discoverability, and that's one of the things that a lot of the brand players are looking for is how, how do I get this thing found? I'm building a great experience, but I need it to kind of live out there in um, in an app store or, or some kind of environment. Having said that, at the same time, the main way of getting you discovered in those places is, is essentially through the marketing tactics that you would deploy, no matter where you have put that platform um, experience, whether that's embedded within an iOS or Android app, whether that's living on a smart speaker, whether it's on the web, uh, or of course, if it's in a you know standalone hardware device or, or something similar. So actually... Discoverability is a bit of a red herring in most cases. The big thing that we need people to be doing is actually driving um, time and attention towards these experiences wherever they are. One of the things that we know from, again, from the survey data that we did earlier in the year is that uh, voice consumers, wherever they're using this, this isn't just smart speakers at all, is that it's a very um, engaged audience who's willing to try stuff. Um, so when we ask people, well, how do you find out what you can do with your voice on a device? The top ranking answer was trial and error, just asking, just seeing what it can do. And, and experimentation and that's a good thing in many ways it shows that people are willing to lean in and have a go but actually the lowest ranking options was from earning you know learning about things through paid own learned media channels and it just goes to show that brands just aren't investing heavily enough yet into um, the discoverability side of things and i think that's because a lot of what we've seen up until now has been in the kind of innovation space it's been the test and learn try it and see and what we're seeing now is um in 2022 people moving much more into building experiences that really sit as kind of a core part of their business uh, particularly in the entertainment space education being another obvious one and even things like health and uh, wellness so you know particularly in things like mental health care um and companionship and you know kind of uh, all that kind of space so i think when it comes to brands we're definitely seeing that trend to voice not just being just a smart speaker thing or just a third party do it on alexa do it on google thing but actually a voice everywhere thing voice search is up on mobile voice usage in the home on mobile and on um you know hearable devices is massively up over the past couple of years particularly driven by covid and so as a result it means you kind of have to build a voice experience that works everywhere because basically wherever the brand wants to live um, there's going to be an expectation that i might be able to access it in that place so that might be my tv that might be 
on my smart speaker, it's very likely inside of my mobile app, if that's something that you have as part of your ecosystem. And of course, then that calls for different um, you know, kind of requirements when it comes to the technology um, that's going to power those experiences as well. And I think that that's the, that's the case across the board um, when it comes to commercial brands and uh, entertainment companies in particular. And then when we kind of level that down into kids, we're seeing more and more kids voice first devices and kind of audio devices that are bespoke for that task coming to market, you know, many of you listening might be familiar with uh, products like yoto for example which is a, a big a big fan of in the audiobook market with these kind of nfc audiobook uh, cards and tokens that interact and obviously in the toys to life space as well we're seeing a lot more um you know people building their own stack uh, to, to be able to do that stuff too so i think we're going to see a, a shift um not necessarily from one to the other but from one to everywhere uh, because you know voice is becoming something that we are you know using in so many more paradigms my favorite stat at the moment of this is you know just take airpods as a, as a business yeah you know, if you broke airpods out from apple and stood it alone as its own company it would be bigger than adobe or nvidia on the stock market that's how many they're selling of these devices and that's before we go into getting anywhere near kind of christmas numbers and new additions right what that's doing is it's training us to use our our ears <laughs> for, to carry around these wearable technologies, um, and you know that's that's impacting kids and, and parents as like, right? Yeah, you know, it's not it's not just adults that are wearing AirPods, and and the similarly you know, the massive market for um, you know kind of Bluetooth headphones expanding into children as well, and that becomes their primary input device. You know, with the more that we have, um, you know, kind of. Uh, people you know wandering around with headphones in place it opens up the um the opportunity and the expectation that they'll be able to use those microphones that are in their environment more and more to interact wherever they are um not just when they're in shouting distance of a smart speaker or when they've got a tablet or a phone directly in front of them and that that sets an entirely different expectation absolutely um there's there's a, a lot of questions coming in and, and on the back of what James is saying, Amelia, about brands and, the, you know, and all of these voice everywhere. Let me ask you this and, and make it a double or triple barreled question, if you don't mind, because I'm seeing all these questions coming in and I'm, I really want us to try and get to as many of them as possible. So I guess the question is on the back of what James has said is, you know, if brands want to control that experience and don't want to make those compromises with the big tech ecosystems in terms of not owning the data and not owning the customer experience, perhaps all the way, uh, is independent voice tech like ours advanced enough now to deliver for all of those different use cases, the kinds of use cases that James was just discussing there and maybe just talk a little bit about that and and to that point here's the, the double and triple barrels people are asking in the q a about accents and dialogues uh, accents and dialects um and uh you know you know how how accurate the voice tech is so maybe if you could kind of touch on on all of that just to give people a sense of how much voice tech has speech technology has advanced recently sure yeah um so when it comes to um, a company, uh, a B2C company, for example, that has created a wonderful, um, beautifully crafted experience for kids, be it educational or play, and then it comes time to plug in the voice recognition technology, um, some of the compromises they'll have to make are it not being accurate. Another one they might have to make is it being biased towards certain um, cohorts of the, or some are certain demographics. Another, like even more obvious one, is that they might, um, you know, have to use wake word technology, where you say, uh, "Hey, computer, uh, do this," and the the system wakes up when you say "computer," but you know, it's not computer; it's um, Alexa or it's Siri. And uh, these big companies, you know, it's it's very difficult to build out or, or to actually find a company that would allow you to have your own wake word that would fit into your beautifully crafted uh, content platform or product that you've spent so long developing that's supposed to deliver this really uh, brilliant experience for kids. And I think the time really has come where that compromise isn't necessary anymore. When it comes to voice first experiences for kids, um, we uh, at Soapbox, for example, we um, deliver, as you said, Neve, um, in the introduction, the entire um, voice uh, system. It's not just uh, the transcription of the audio file, but it's wake word, it's keyword spotting, it's uh, confidence scores, it's breaking down the pronunciation of what the kid said right down to the individual speech uh, sound in the file. 
um, all these different um, features that our, our engine can provide based on whatever it is you need as a, as a company that you're going to provide to um, your clients. And the fact of the matter is that for a kid's speech, you need different things than the adult speech tech would actually be have to provide for you. So, for example, the uh, breakdown at the phonetic level, it's something that educators and even in the play market as well, uh, really, really want and need, but it's not really something that comes as standard in, in adult voice tech. So um, on that, and I think I did see a question in the chat there as well about uh, particular accents and dialects, for example, African-American English that might um, have a different pronunciation of a word that is systematic within their uh, the way they speak English and maybe not systematic in the way another group of people speak English. Um, as an Irish person, um, there's ways I say words that are very, very different from the way that British English uh, speakers and American English speakers say words. Um, so we deal with this all at a very, um, from the technological level, like for example, we can have dictionary entries for different um, ways of pronouncing things that might be um, something that's very, very common in one dialect and not another. At Soapbox, this is something that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, we uh, have uh, made these decisions to try and make our technology as agnostic as possible to accents and dialects and all the uh, different uh, variations that you find in each. But also we have the benefit of having very state-of-the-art technology and um, very big neural nets that are trained on an awful lot of data. And we've made sure that the data has been chosen from very diverse sources so that we haven't just like, I mean, with a lot of technology, it's generally people of all the same demographic choosing data from all the same demographic to put in a model that then only works for people of that demographic. This is a systematic problem across not only speech recognition, but all of, of technology. And at Soapbox, not only are we very proud in the um, diversity of the people who work for us, but also of the um, of the data that we have and making sure that the data that goes into training the models is taken from all these different sources to cover as many accents and dialects as possible so that it works for kids of all um, ethnicities, of all socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, this is hugely, hugely important. Um, for speech technology, because when you start using speech technology or vo any kind of voice technology as a tool, it, it gets integrated into systems and then it gets um, any problems that are there might get perpetuated and echoed and amplified as more and more people use it. And it's really, really, I think, I think people who work in AI have a moral ob obligation not to let that happen. And at Soapbox, it's something that we keep an eagle eye on. Um, it's, uh, we take it very, very seriously and we test for it all the time. And um, actually, we're not the only people who test. So, for example, the Florida Center for Reading Research have done independent studies um, on the Soapbox engine uh, and have found that um, children from um, different demographics, I think it was Latino children, black children and white children, and they found that our system showed no bias towards any particular cohort. And I, um, I think that uh, study might be pub published very soon, and hopefully we can um, share that link when it is. So... Um, Sorry, I'm not sure if I've answered all your questions, Niamh. Yeah, that's great. Um, one of the other questions here, and actually, well, let's go to questions for a moment, and then I really do want to leave some time at the end, if possible, to talk metaverse, because sure. James James has some great vision on, on, on what's going on in the metaverse next year, um, and Amelia, you too, so let's try and get there before we finish, but there's lots and lots of questions here, a lot of them leaning on the technical side, Amelia, so a lot of them for you. Um, the error rate is one thing that's come up. Um, so we we did some research with Amplify or Amplify actually themselves. One of our education clients did some research. Maybe you would touch on that briefly. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, Amplify are one of our, our uh, really um, biggest clients who who were very very proud of the use case that they have and they have it out there. And uh, we've children using it. We've teachers using it. And um, they uh, have a, a lot of real world data that they test our system very thoroughly uh, with. And recently they found that um, our system was an unprecedented 96% accurate. Um, this is absolutely huge. I mean, you hear um, 
the likes of IBM and Microsoft talking about um, 95% accuracy on a certain adult speech database called uh, Switchboard that's been around since, I don't know, the 80s or 90s. And um, usually it's used as a benchmark for how well these systems perform. When these systems are tested on child speech, usually they're only somewhere between 40 and 60% accurate. For us to achieve 96% accuracy on real world child speech is absolutely phenomenal. And it's something we're really, really proud of. Yeah, and so and, thanks for mentioning it, Neve, because I love talking about it. Yeah, no, not at all. And and, and somebody asked me once, you know, is ninety six percent good? And I it, I realized what a great question. You know, we mm. understand it because we're in the industry, but is ninety is 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 ninety nine percent possible? And ninety well, percent. You go on, you answer it. Actually, sorry, just, to, to yeah. put it this way, um, humans normally don't get ninety six percent accuracy when they're asked to do these tasks. They could be anywhere between ninety and ninety five, ninety six percent accuracy, but it, it's very rare. So yep. we're just as good or better than um, a human transcriber could do. Super. And uh, there's a couple of questions about special ed, um, speech disorders and special how voice technology can be used in special education. Would you mind touching on that a little bit? Yeah, this again um, comes under um, all the facets of education that um, voice technology can help with. Um, so, for example, um, if you are a teacher or an educator and you want to um, have some kind of tool that would help you spot, for example, if a child is dyslexic, um, if a child is um, showing um, behaviors of uh, dyspraxia, for example, um, or even if they're, they're having trouble with speech and language with articulation of particular phonemes. Um, that's, again, why um, our voice engine has certain features that uh, adult voice engines wouldn't necessarily have, because um, Again, you know, when we uh, return information about how uh, the pronunciation of particular words and phrases and we can, del we can dive right down to the individual speech sound, this allows teachers and educators to be able to spot that uh, systematic um, difficulties with uh, reading or pronunciation very, very quickly. And again, you know, being the voice technology developer, it's our job to make sure that this technology is very, very accurate and works really well and provide these different uh, product features. But then we have uh, clients who are so imaginative in coming up with different ways to uh, spot these um, different um, problems uh, that kids might experience when they're learning to read, for example. Um, like, uh, again, the Florida Center for Reading Research. I, actually, I think somebody asked me to repeat that name. Again, they're a university group in Florida and they have, uh, they have been testing our system system with um, the uh, dyslexia tests where, for example, they would show a child um, a sequence of pictures like a house, a car, a dog, a cat, and the child would have to say them and um, you time how quickly the child says them. And then you show the child those words in writing, house, car, dog, cat, and time how quickly it is to say it. And you can, there's uh, studies done that show that um, it, you should be able to read them X amount slower than you would identify the pictures. But for children uh, with dyslexia, um, that uh, gap is huge. So it takes them much, much, much longer to read the words compared to how they would react if they saw the pictures. So using voice technology to do this really, really accurately and have kids do it in their own homes with their parents, it removes uh, um, any kind of uh, performance anxiety that the kid might have if they're being tested in these scenarios. And um, it's just really, really useful and innovative way of using speech technology for, for these kind of reading difficulties and speech and language problems. Yeah. Just to add to that, I think you know, what Amelia is saying is you know, so important in terms of thinking about that kind of difference in speech pattern in particular in the way in which that handles that. And that also then comes to what choices you're making in terms of where you actually put this technology, right? There are a lot of limitations on certain device types about how long, for example, you can leave a microphone open or whether or not it will interrupt because it thinks that you're hearing uh, something that it hasn't understood entirely. And that, that therein lies some of the problems, both at a um, you know, kind of speech to text and text to speech kind of NLP level, but also at a device level as well, because if you are kind of reliant upon third party devices rather than necessarily integrating something you know, fully integrated for yourself, you can't control those parameters paradigms you have to work with kind of what's available to us and we've seen this a few times when building um voice experiences for kids 
on some of the third party platforms is you know, kids naturally they want to interrupt you or they might want to pause longer or you know, they get distracted and they come back and they expect consistency or um, you know, the consistency of experience that they you know, remember where they were in the conversation uh, but the device or, or the experience doesn't necessarily remember and then when you begin to then start putting into you know, kind of special educational needs and other uh, you know, kind of paradigms like that then that just only gets exacerbated because you're dealing with all sorts of other you know, kind of expectation setting not just in terms of uh, the language understanding but also the context in which that is happening uh, particularly the difference between that being in a kind of classroom setting where there might be multiple children you know kind of in that space as well as also a teacher controlling a single device versus perhaps in the home or in in headphones where it's more of a one-to-one experience so you know one of the things that we have to think about a lot as we kind of go into these design uh, processes is is trying to think about what is actually the best setting and context for that interaction to happen in and then also what's the best technology to be able to handle it and it, it, you need to kind of have the, the context and the technology constantly working in in tandem with each other to make sure that that's something that's viable because so often um that the, so often it's not <laughs> And I'm just looking at the questions here and I'm looking at the time. We have six minutes if we're going to uh, keep to our promise of finishing on time. And um, if there's if there's a, a couple of the team members from Soapbox there who can answer some of the links that people are looking for, the link to um, the Florida Center work, uh, link to YouTube, um, and to James's point talking about um, user experience, uh, Declan Moore, our head of UX, has a great uh, guide, a beginner's guide to voice experiences. If we can throw that link into the channel as well for people before, um, before we finish, that would be great. Um, so many questions here, let's see. Um, Jessica's asking Amelia whether the 96% accuracy is on phonemes or language transcription. Um, so it's on um, the words. So generally, when people report an accuracy um, in speech recognition, it's a, it's a word accuracy rate. Um, sometimes it's um, represented as a word error rate. So you might hear it's like 5% error or 4% error equals 96% accuracy. Um, so as far as I know, Amplify, um, they didn't report on the phoneme accuracy, but um, it's something that we've done internally and hope, hope to release some very interesting numbers on that in the new year. Um, somebody asks, have we tested our voice technology on adults? <laughs> yes, actually we have, yeah. Um, it uh, works particularly well because of specific way that we built it. Um, so generally it's, it's more useful for kids and, and it's, it's built with kids in mind. So it will always work better for kids, but, um, you know, I, I do try it myself from time to time and I'm surprised with the results. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we finish, let's talk metaverse since it is the, uh, it is the, uh, the topic of the moment. Uh, James, tell us what you think are going to be the ways that brands are going to use voice in the metaverse. And then maybe we'll give the last word on it to, to Amelia before we close up. Sure. So, I mean, if you read any popular studies, then next year will be the year of the metaverse and they are all wrong. Um, 100 percent wrong completely un like it will be nowhere near the year of the metaverse the, it might be more likely to be the year of the mobile but we've been waiting for that for the past decade um so don't don't kind of like come out of the races tomorrow you know you might see adidas buying nfts yes nike's just bought an nft company yes uh, oculus sales are up but they are nothing compared to uh you know even the comparatively the sales of alexa devices right in the past year um so before we kind of go down that rabbit hole just pump your brakes and kind of wait now having said that whether you were going to spend you know, what you mean by the metaverse is probably a helpful thing to define first of all um does it mean spending some time in vr probably does it mean using some kind of augmented reality experience on a phone more likely in the years to come on some glasses Yes, maybe it does. Uh, does it actually also mean hanging out in social media? Absolutely. Um, all of these things are versions of what we will know as the metaverse. But I think what we need to be thinking about is um, shared um, synchronous experiences wherever that happens, right? That's that's the promise to VR and AR is that we are having a synchronicity in our experience, but we are sharing something digital. And most of our social experiences right now are asynchronous. Zoom, this would be an example of the metaverse, right? Like we are in a synchronous voice and audio experience where we are geolocated in different places. You could argue this is the metaverse, but no one's kind of like talking about what their 2022 Zoom strategy is going to be other than do less of it. So it's important to kind of state that out the bat. 
But where this kind of goes is, you know, one of the things that when you have, um, you know, kind of a lack of object permanence, as in we're all in different places and we're you know, interacting with 3D, 2D, physical or digital screens, um, you know, one of the things that is consistent is our voices, right? This is the thing that remains consistent. I'm speaking, you're hearing me, whether I'm wearing an avatar, whether my background is blurred, whether, you know, you know you're seeing uh, me wearing a kind of digitally NFT in Nike baseball cap or whatever it might be. The thing that remains consistent is speech. Um, because otherwise it's an asynchronous solution, right? And then you're no longer kind of happening in a permanent metaverse kind of place. You're you're back into kind of more traditional ideas of things like social media. And that really matters because I think one of the things that we see um, an evolution of is not only the ability to understand speech, which is everything that, you know, Soapbox uh, does and has been speaking about, but also the ability to generate speech. That's the other end of the spectrum, right? Is so at the other end, we've got things like synthetic AI being able to generate speech. Now we've seen bad use cases of that with things like deep fakes. Uh, we've just partnered this week, uh, just announced a partnership with Veritone, who are one of the kind of leading um, companies in the world of generated speech in a kind of ethical way. So synthetic voice cloning in, in an ethical fashion, which matters matters massively because if you want to revive a celebrity of years gone by or create a talk to me tickle me elmo that can say literally anything you're going to need the ability to generate speech not just to be able to understand it um and that's great but also opens up the question of if we're going to spend 10 minutes in oculus or you know five hours a day you know kind of wandering around with ar glasses on our faces one of the things you're going to want to make sure is that you know when someone is speaking to you whether or not they're really there and it's really their voice. And in very short order, that's gonna be quite difficult to do at a kind of just basic human level. And that's when we need to begin to think about the real role of things like NFTs. You've probably seen lots of chat about non-fungible tokens um, and going like, why are people buying you know, pictures of apes and sending it to one another and mis-selling them today for three grand instead of 300,000? That's interesting, but it's actually not that important comparative to where this goes. I think where this goes is in a world where you need guarantees of digital items, um, you need a, a means of proving ownership of that. That's what an NFT is there to do. It's there to say you holistically are the one of one owner of this thing. And the only thing in the metaverse that you should probably be concerned about being the digital owner one of one of is your voice. And I think that particularly if you are a celebrity, if you're anyone that's done any public speaking, if you're a politician, and also if you're a parent of a child, um, you should be concerned about that because you want to know that when a child is speaking to your child in the metaverse in real time live is it real is it synthetic and if it's real whose is it and are they owning it or if it's synthetic if it's being modulated who created it and can you prove that and that's when you begin to see kind of the um the impacts of things like nfts in that space and i think it's going to open up some pretty wild um wild opportunities but so next year won't be the year of the metaverse fast forward five maybe we get to a year of some of the metaverse but you know definitely something to start thinking about that's excellent i'm so relieved that next year is not the year of the metaverse. Yeah. thank you you've put me put my mind at rest there emilia final words to you and then we will let everybody yeah. go and just before we finish we we will we will follow up with everybody we'll answer some of your questions to you individually and um, by email afterwards too thank you all so much Thanks, uh, Neve and James. I fully agree with you. Uh, next year can't be the year of the metaverse. It, there's always a lag. People are just getting used to the idea. Um, what we see in Soapbox and with Kids Voice, 2020, all the major players in the education space came to us looking for POCs. Uh, we built them out. We took customers on the journey of how they can actually integrate voice into their products and make it a better experience. 2022, sorry, did I say 2020 earlier? Uh, 2021 is when we saw that. 2022 is when we're going to see these products come to the market and people start using them and they're going to be in people's lives and people will wonder how they ever lived without them. That's what 2022 is going to be in Voice for Kids. And then what we're working on for the, the future, we're already working on clients, uh, working with clients who are working on um, conversational experiences. So we, we can also, we can already do intent recognition when a child says that they basically when next time my, sister, my uh, daughter wants to listen to Dusty Sprinkles, I think my um, voice system is going to know what she means and be able to play it. We're working on these conversational experiences. Um, we're building from limited to spontaneous dia dialogue and it's already well on its way. It's going to be a really, really exciting future for kids' speech technology. 
Fabulous. What a great place to end. Thank you both so much for this really uh, illuminating and fun conversation. Uh, wishing everybody very happy holidays and, uh, and a great new year. Thanks all. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, James.